uh, one year ago today, you know, um, he is, he's been down there, I think since 2019, maybe 2020. And one year ago today, uh, not today, but this month, um, he called me after I didn't talk to him in a long time. And he said, I finally saw the documentary and he goes, I need, he goes, my lack of accountability um, was not fair to you. And he said, I, and I, and I recorded the conversation on my laptop. It was a 45 minute conversation. And he, he said, he goes, um, I need to tell you that I did it. And I, nobody else was involved. Uh, I did it. And I, you're, and I want to, he goes on, I read in the newspaper and I saw in the documentary um, where you were worried that your son suffered and all this. And he goes, and I just want to tell you, he didn't, he's, it was fast. And he goes, I don't know why I did it because your son was walking away, but I, um, I just shot him. And of course, as he's telling me this, I'm like, ugh you know, imagining it playing out in my head, you know, it's like slow motion. I'm like imagining here's my baby. And I'm just like, he's not, I'm not there. I can't comfort him, you know, and, but I was really um, happy to hear his accountability and that he had come to a place of, uh, He's slowly but surely coming around, you know, so. Do you still, no, do you still keep in contact with him at all? He called me a couple months ago and uh, we had a conversation. He kind of updated me once in a while. He'll call. He updates me on some of the stuff that he does. Um, I have advocated for his rehabilitation um, and, you know, I've also obviously something that I like really passionate about is the treatment of people that are incarcerated and that I would like to see it afforded to, to everybody, you know, I, no matter what their sentence is. And like, if somebody is willing and ready to do treatment, someone like Josh would be um, a good candidate, no matter how long he has left to serve. And my mind in that, because I lived experience, um, that he would, it would be beneficial just for the simple fact as the longer that you live in recovery, the easier it gets. And it makes it easier for you to get out and live a full life. But if you wait until somebody's like, six months to the door or a year to the door while the whole time they're in prison, they're getting high, getting write ups. And then you're like, okay, if you want furlough or uh, parole, then you got to do treatment. And so they go to treatment with the idea, well, I'm going to get released early and they don't have a huge amount of recovery under their belt. And not just that, it's always the ones that are like the most influential that are, you know, long-term inmates that should be the ones that are being treated first because they are the ones that are influencing the newer ones coming in. And so uh, it is my hope that we can see something change in that aspect because in my, um, in my um, belief is what are you telling me as the mother of a murdered child when you're not rehabilitating the person that killed my child you're telling me that I don't matter and neither did my son instead you're just warehousing him for now until 20 years from now he can get treatment I'm not okay with that <laughs> you know oh, that's so, yeah exactly and that's I kind of wanted to um ask you because you said Carl your husband has turned oh and gone a total different way and I think I know the answer to this. <laughs> and and I, I understand how people might 
might say, well, this guy was a gang leader and, you know, he's manipulating. We're not going to trust. We're not going to trust that right away. But how, how long, or even if it's happened yet, um, do you feel like Department of Corrections has said, okay, we feel like you really want to, you want to turn your life around and man, talk about someone who could really be a positive influence and help these young guys who are getting into gangs and stuff. How long, if it has happened, do you think DOC has stepped in and said, you know what, we're going to help you because you want to help yourself or has it been more of, um, yeah, no, you're in prison. Fuck you pretty much. Yeah. Uh, it was like that in the first, um, be in the very beginning, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, God really spoke to my heart about Carl when I first had a conversation with him. And I remember one of the conversations being, we were just friends at the time. He goes, Oh, well, you know, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were in a relationship. I was like, that's not true. I didn't want to like argue with him, but in his mind, you know, um, right. I was like, okay. I just was like, okay, so he, I know that God's going to like do some huge, if, if he, if God could do, get a hold of this man, he would do damage to the, you know, kingdom of Satan, you know, I mean, he would totally just like undo them. And then when Carl did make that decision, it was not easy. I had people turn on me. I had people that did not want to work with me. I had people having secret meetings. My own, my own people were having secret meetings about me and my relationship with Carl. Uh, there was DOC staff going out into the public and going and talking to my partners with Fallen Up Ministries and telling them that I was in a relationship with a sociopath and that He's eventually, or he's grooming me to eventually bring drugs into the prison. This is what they're telling, they're telling, you know, so I had a lot of people come against me and even my own people that I thought believed in me, turn their backs on me and would not work with me. And so, but I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew. And I, and I had to like, no matter how painful it was, is I had to like, believe what God had said to me that, you know, that Carl had a future and that God was going to do some mighty things through him. And I thought, and I told Carl, I was like, you need to write letters. You need to start reaching out and start advocating for yourself. And I'll be on this end and I will be advocating for you. You know, of course he had like lots of pushback. I had a lot of pushback from him sometimes because he was like, it's never going to change every four years. They come in and change stuff up. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I was like, I don't, he goes, and they're not going to let me in the faith pod because of who I am. And I was like, just fill it out. Just fill out the application. Okay. And just trust God's going to do, you know, some miracles because part of the getting in the faith pod and the TLC pod program was that you could not be a validated gang member. And I was like, I did not like that rule because that's mm -hmm. where, God, where we need to have those type of people in these programs. If they want to change, these are the ones that need to be in there. And so uh, I had lots of um, pushback and it was not easy. And uh, I had to like send emails and it took years and years and years. And finally you know, this last time when he was at Spring Creek, you know, um, and they finally listened when somebody, you know, told staff that there was a hit put out on him and another inmate. Uh, then they finally listened. They thought it was just, you know, us making up stuff. And <clears throat> then that, then that's when they finally did send them to um, Wildwood, which we'd been, we'd been pushing for years. You know, and there was some staff that prior to that, you know, that intentionally um, would sabotage and do things to like make his time harder or intentionally put him in situations where, you know, he would relapse or, you know, he was not in a, a, a pod that was um, conducive with his 
what he was trying to do with his life and uh, him being new in recovery. And, um, you know, you can't put somebody in the, the trap house and, and say, good luck. You know what I mean? And so that was a battle too, trying to get them to listen to us in that aspect. But here we are um, seven years later and Carl, um, who was the training videos uh, for DOC, you know, um, rookie officers would come on and be like, oh, I seen you in the training videos and you're not what I thought you were, but I was scared of you when I first saw you. And you'd be like, dude, I'm just not, you know, I'm not like that, you know? Um, and so, um, he, he's the perfect person to really like give an example to how DOC should consider operating uh, in the decisions that they make when somebody like him has been begging for the opportunity to change their lives uh, and giving them that opportunity. Because if they really say they're about rehabilitation and reducing the violence and the drugs and all that stuff inside the institutions, then we need to be looking at the people that are long-termers and people that are saying, okay, I want to change. And yes, I know that I've caused chaos in the system, um, but just give me an opportunity. It hasn't always been easy, but I'm so proud of my husband. And now I feel like there's, I'm not going to lie. There's been moments where I thought, oh my gosh, God, did you really say that? Like, did I make the right decision? And, you know, there was moments where I was like, I, I was this close to like walking away because, you know, he relapsed and it was hard, difficult to communicate with him. And finally, I was just like, one week I was like, I told him, I was like, I'm going to Bethel School Supernatural Ministry for five days. I need to get refreshed. I was like, this is like just done too much on my heart, you know, you have a, you don't have a choice to not be an addict, but you have a choice to not, or to be in recovery. And you need to make that decision on your own. And I cannot force you. I'm not going to make your recovery more important to me than it is to you. And I said, I need to take care of myself and I'm not going to keep doing this. And so I made a decision to <clears throat> go and get refreshed down at Bethel school, supernatural ministry, met my friend Kara down there. She was in school. She was in her second year she was in her second year and um I had a refreshing I when I finally when I left I felt like I had this massive oppression over me and I was just like so heartbroken and like devastated when I got there I was like oh su such a refreshing of the Holy Spirit and just surrounded by all these people and love and while I was there I prayed for my husband and then I wrote a prayer prior to leaving and I pinned it to the wall. It was August of 2019. I pinned it to the wall with a tack and I prayed and asked God, this is all I want for my husband. And if it is your will, then do it. And then I went to Bethel several months later, four months later. And Carl, while I was in Bethel, Carl went to the officer and said, move me get me out of here. I I'm struggling. And he was just completely honest. And ever since then, January of 2020 is when it happened. Um, that was his last relapse. So, and he's been just going and going and going since then. So, uh, you know, he'd had moments of sobriety and then relapse. And then now he's back on track. And this time I, it really stood out. What really stood out to me is that he completed TLC he had his relapse, but then he got back on track. He went to Wildwood and he did RSAT. He advocated and begged. They were like, no, you're on, not on the list. There's people heavy. He's like, went up and he's like, I want to do RSAT. And I, you know, and he just kept hammering at the probation officer and I was sending emails. And then he calls me and he goes, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to RSAT. And so he went to RSAT and graduated. And he was furlough eligible and parole eligible. And upon his graduation, this was in November. And then he calls me and he goes, um, you know that I want to be a barber. 
and you know how bad that I've been wanting to do this for years. And um, he goes, would you support me in staying in prison another year if a barber, if I had an opportunity to do the barber school, because they're saying they're going to bring one here to Wildwood. And I was like thinking instantly. And I was like, yes. And I said, the reason why I support you is because you're sh it's showing that you are giving up your immediate gratification and thinking about your future. And so that really spoke volumes to me because normally anybody would be like, okay, I know I'm done with our sad. I want to go home. I want to furlough. I want to go on parole. But he's thinking about his, he goes to his PO and says, he gets off the phone and he looks at his probation officer and he does a thumbs up to his PO saying, my wife supports me. <laughs> and so um, as soon as they started the, the class, he went straight from RSAT to the, um, the barber school and he should be done hopefully by the end of uh, September, beginning of October or something like that. So has he had, has he run into a lot of officers that are supportive or, or even a couple officers that are supportive. And I ask this because I know that when I first started as an officer, it was totally us against them. And yeah, you're not taught, hey, if you have someone that's trying to change, this is this is the steps you go through with them. This is no, you're taught you take as much as you can. If you can take someone to segregation, awesome. That's a win for the day. If you can write people up, in fact, if you're not writing people up, you're not doing your job. And they're gonna be your neighbors. Most people are gonna get out. Why do we do this? Why do we why do we not have officers that are looking for the Carls who want to change on the RSAT floor so he can go in and talk like a mentor? And so he's seeing all the new people come in and a lot of them are youngsters that are involved in gangs. And so, of course, they're going to like, no, they all know who Carl is, you know, low down is what they call him. They all know who he is. And then they like, and then my husband, he just goes in and like has these conversations and there's officers that he, that Carl doesn't even know that he, they're hearing what he's saying, but my husband gets real and he talks the lingo. He's like, Hey dog, you know, <laughs> just stuff like that. And of course those youngsters are going to listen to him because he, he, um, he relates to them in that aspect. And these officers pull him aside afterwards and just like, wow, it's just really refreshing to see someone like you really change your life. And this is why I got into this work. He goes, I know that not everybody does, but he goes, this is why I got into this work because I wanted to see stuff like this. And I wanted to make a difference. He goes, Explain to me why you gave up your parole and your furlough. He's like, mm. and they just are like totally blown away. And I think that they're seeing finally that he was sincere and that all they had to do was give him an opportunity years ago and that they, all of this stuff could have been, you know, all the other things that, you know, happened along the way could have been prevented.